So I'm going to read mostly things from, from the new book, The Dead Zoo, and maybe a couple of even newer things, um, if I may. So the, the name of this book comes from a nickname for the Natural History Museum in, in Dublin, uh, in Ireland. And the story of how I came on it was, was basically in the middle of the boom over there. I was staying with a friend of mine who bought an, a very overpriced house in the center of Dublin only to discover that it was kind of falling apart uh, once he moved in. So the day before my wife and I came down to sort of to stay with him, um, they'd started to remodel the kitchen and the kitchen had started to collapse and um, literally to, to sort of to fall apart. Uh, the roof was falling in and the walls were falling in as they were trying to ha hang these cabinets. Um, so he, he sort of called and he's like, I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to hang out with you when you're down in Dublin. And so I was like, that's okay. And we, we sort of figured out a couple of things that we might want to do while we were there. And one of them was visiting the Natural History Museum. And at that point, I'd never actually called it, heard it called the Dead Zoo. And he was like immediately, oh, you wanna, you're going to go to the Dead Zoo. So we went. And it, it sort of turned into a kind of a, 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 an obsession, I suppose, um, is the thing to say. It's a strange museum in that it's, it's preserved in its, its kind of 19th century authenticity. So you can still see the bullet holes in the heads of the animals and things that are there. Um, there's a lot of things in jars. Uh, there's a lot of just bizarre sort of 19th century stuff um, on display. So this is the title poem from the collection. This is, this is sort of that first experience of, of kind of, of walking into the Dead Zoo. The Dead Zoo. A display on the parasites of pigs. A basking shark caught off the coast of Clare and this eel with a frog stuck in its throat. Their fused bodies white as a stoat in winter. In the swimming pool blue of the ethyl alcohol, they might come to define shock or hunger. The eel's mouth opened like an eye-toothed snare lost in the gulp that is its last supper. The frog's legs forever desperate and askew and neither prey nor predator, aware of how their embrace fixes and lingers. The moment stilled and distilled, offered up as parable or prayer to whoever wanders and wonders about here. Watched by glass eyes, I step past a musk ox, a leopard cat posed crossing a loped branch, the crates of whales suspended from the ceiling like colder mobiles in some art museum. It is as if I've stepped into a painting or a funeral home where the bodies have been drained and then embalmed, dressed and redressed in their best clothes so that they seem both at rest and ready to rise again, go down to the shops for milk and cigarettes. There are sea creatures blown from glass by a father and son team who knew Dresden long before the Allies bombed perfect replicas of the sea anemone and sea urchin with that mouth Aristotle compares to a lantern connecting hunger and light as any of us might connect the sea snail and the sea cucumber, mistake the antlers of the moose for those of the fallow deer or take a bowerbird for a jackdaw or a crow. On the second floor, I stop before a polar bear brought back from the North Pole by explorers sent out to recover those fallen in the cause of science and their country. The captain's log describing the split codfish hung to dry in the rigging, the walrus that shot sinks before the dogs can claim its meat, and how desperate, freezing, a woman holds up her newborn, begging for a needle to darn her clothes. Not, you might suppose, unlike the one the taxidermist used to sew this pelt, snow white, with a hint of piss and snow yellow over a quadruped of wood and wood shavings arranged to replicate the shape and gait of bear. I reach out my hand, insert into the bullet hole my middle finger, 
finding a new way to stay silent, to stay still. Remembering the vet at the Alculia Zoo as he sews back together a tear-gassed zebra, the giraffe that lost its pulse in a stampede, a seam running like a centipede from its anus to its chin. Remembering how last summer I saw the dead sewn up and skinned for exhibition, the human form displayed in cross-sections or flayed and filled with silicone in an attempt to stay what is forever in motion, and even now moving away from the school children, taking turns to peer in at the dwarf chameleon, the hamster reduced to just a house of bones, and the life cycle of the midwife toad frozen beneath glass where they'll leave their smudged thumbprints and spent breath. This is a shorter poem, so we can all get our breaths back. <laughs> I was in Boston recently um, for a reading and I was tired. So I, I discovered this great thing is, rather than introducing the poem yourself, you just sort of ask a question of the audience and then somebody else sort of gives the backstory. So um, does anybody know the story of what happens to Einstein's brain after um, he died? Anybody? Some of you are plants. Some of you have heard this poem before. It's a refrigerator, right? In, in Nebraska? Or it was kept in a refrigerator for a long time. A jar. It was stolen. Oh, it was stolen. By the... Um, yeah, it was stolen by a guy named Thomas Harvey, um, who convinced the family to do an autopsy and then made off with the brain and drove around the country with it for, for quite a number of years. Um, and it would occasionally give bits of it to researchers whose, whose work he thought was um, worthy of it, but mostly kept it to himself. He just sort of, he coveted the brain. So this is an imagining of, of, of that, um, stealing Einstein's brain. In the trunk of his Buick, from state to state, he has carried the greatest mind of the century, setting it down with his keys and lucky strikes on the dressers of a hundred cheap motels, feeling what must be the slight fire of envy when he thinks about the life that stemmed from that brainstem and of the life he had to leave behind like a body on a gurney in Princeton filled not with the larvae of blowflies but with the lies we tell ourselves again and again that in turn tell the story of our longing. Ask him about the instability of time or how objects might behave in a vacuum and he'll tell you about his second wife, how in their sparse room off Highway 61, she slips tipsy into her wedding gown and raises to her ear the mason jar that contains all that remains of Einstein above ground. For half an hour, she waltzes back and forth, staring into the split mirror, eyes closed, feeling the cold press against her cheek half believing she's just married a genius. <laughs> this is another Einstein poem. <laughs> so once you get hooked on one of these things, you can't stop. <laughs> um, this one takes its title from Einstein's, oh, Jeff is here, where's Jeff? Jeff wrote a poem about this in English 270. Um, it takes its title from Einstein's word for, or sorry, phrase for, for quantum physics, which he was very skeptical about. Um, so he called it spooky action at a distance. Uh, he didn't believe that it was possible. Uh, the, poem, the poem's an elegy for my cousin. Um, and like, I, I didn't want to write just straight elegies in this book. So what I tried to do was, was sort of 
twist the elegies, the, the normal sort of functions of, of the elegy around thinking about something else and, and try and get some sort of a metaphorical correspondence between um, the two things. So in this case, it's trying to figure out quantum physics um, and obviously as a poet failing miserably. Uh, spooky action at a distance. There's also an epigraph from Einstein, which is, nature shows us only the tail of the lion, but I have no doubt that the lion belongs with it, even if he cannot reveal himself all at once. Of the blinkered gelding circling the paddock, the greyhound's blind stagger after the hare. Out of what might as well have been thin air, I'd pluck a name and place in each way bet. Those afternoons her father took me to the horses and the dogs. What did I know then of the odds, the world to come? I was Einstein's beetle, crawling the surface of the bark, unaware the branches curved, his naturalist, fondling sightless the lion's tail. The past, the future, were entangled particles. They made a world where she will always be a girl in jodhpurs and a riding hat, just come from the stables as the car backs down the driveway of my earliest memory. One of my four gorgeous cousins from up north migrated south in June, and not a bruised, starved arm hooked to a morphine drip. Spooky action at a distance, the physicist called it. How bodies can act off each other outside space and time in a way no theory can fully explain. And so our brilliant skeptic schizophrenic son taking up his violin to bow at Brahms while in a different room on a separate continent his father does the same. And so the twin, mal shopping in an East Texas town, who feels pain sharp as a stake stabbing his chest, as states away a bullet strays into his brother's heart. Or how a moment, barely lived through the first time, might swim back suddenly into the mind, insinuate its way into the present tense. I remember now, we were going to the hospital, I'd slipped, my mother thought I'd cracked the hip that today still seems to creak in its socket, predicting rain. The car is a Chrysler or a Hillman Hunter, something turquoise, boat-like and exotic. But I can't see anymore who's doing the driving or feel the hands the doctor presses to my skin. I'm not sure now it isn't a different sister waving as we turn soundless out into the lane. Scent of tobacco and seat leather on the air, the crows hanging like rotting fruit from a crab apple tree, memory fixing a blindfold over my eyes and spinning me three times so that I stagger blind about her silent rooms. The hounds bound for the inside track, the gate springs, and the horse bolts for its stall. Only hunger and the hand that cracks the whip to grind it, grind it home. And though I haven't found a way to say it yet, my cousin's dying back into the nothing she sprang from. Earth into earth again, ash into ash, and I just don't want to write another elegy. We must remember that this is a small star, Einstein explains, against what the heart whispers, against what the body always seems to want. Later, on a ship out in a storm, the deck awash with the madness of the ocean, the cabin swaying so that his pen rolls back and forth across his midnight desk. His insignificance and ours has never been more apparent. Yet all he can do is smile, far from anyone, and well beyond caring. And for once, I envy him such indifference. This next poem is, um, I 
guess it's over a year ago now. Is it two years ago now? What year are we in? <laughs> um, yeah, I, think, I guess it was two years ago. Let me check my notes. This is why I have notes at the back of the book. It's actually not for you, it's so I can remember. Um, yeah, it was 2012. In 2012, about a year after the Japanese tsunami, you, you might remember a ghost ship, a ship that had sort of come loose um, during the sort of during the turmoil of the tsunami, floated towards the coast of Alaska and was sunk uh, by the Coast Guard. I'm not sure why they sunk it. You know, I don't know. Maybe sort of you know hostile seagulls or something. <laughs> So this is about that Japanese ghost ship. What then to make of it, the boat unmanned and drifting towards our ken, a year on from the trouble in Japan. The current surge against bulwark and seawall, it's brimming over, as with the porridge in the fairy tale, I could only half recall climbing the cleft lip of the pot to flood the town. I'd seen pictures of a yacht run aground atop the felt roof of a summer home like the ark beached on its peak at Ararat. Cars tossed hither, thither like matchbox cars, a wreck of breeze blocks all of a sudden strewn. For so long we'd been allowed our mute distance from the deluge, reading the captions as they scrolled across the screen making checks out to the Red Cross. But here was its rust-gutted avatar, floating towards Anchorage and Sitka, listing and ablaze. A ghost ship that could not be explained by reference to the latest pirate flick, or the armada of rubber ducks adrift in the subpolar gyre, with all we've lost, with all we've thrown away. No role Amundsen to help their badling find its way through the Bering Strait, only to wash ashore later at Tainmouth or Kinsale. If our craft unmoored was message in a bottle, it wasn't one we wanted to receive. More than wet ink, it seemed one of those oil-skinned bodies the sea coughs up half-chewed from time to time. We set the sandbags high at the back door, as if to keep the tide at bay. We dreamed ourselves shipbuilders again, saw how the animals would enter two by two. A shrimp or squid boat, explained the news anchor. We should have known that it was more. Before the Coast Guard shot across its bows, it came closer, like the future of this broken home of ours, mostly water, dressed up as a sunburned explorer, coming to shore among amazed natives with guns and gunpowder. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a little bit of Elvis. You ready for a little bit of Elvis? Okay. Um, this is a new poem. All of, the, all of the facts in it, although it's called Elvis Impersonator, all of the facts in it are, are actually from the life of the man himself, um, including the play, places that he, that he played or performed. Uh, it's, a, it's a persona poem. It's, 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 it's a sort of a, um, yeah, it's a persona poem. It's a poem in the, in the voice of, of somebody other than me, just in case you get scared. <laughs> and they keep the building very fast. Elvis Impersonator. In Phoenix, Amarillo, or Abilene, everyone waits downstairs for me to sing. I will go on after the last comedian, swapping my hair shirt for this jumpsuit of sequins. I wait for the last gag to end, the one about ex-wives. I wait for canned laughter, the dry ripple of applause. As if each newborn came shadowed by a stilled twin who must exist again in the shadow of his sibling, lost 
to Demerol and Dexedrine to Placidil, cocaine. I am the stand-in who stands quiffed and clad in hand-me-downs beneath the mirror ball, its slow dance and spin. I am the hind legs and bare ass of the pantomime horse, the rodeo clown squeezing into a pair of cast-off blue suede shoes. As the butter melts in your popcorn bucket and you begin to dream again of the drive-in, the beehive haircut and the Dairy Queen in Wichita, South Bend or Birmingham. In Tulsa, Tuscaloosa or Des Moines, this is my foil, my put-on face and the truth, God's honest, I was so bored with being only myself as we all are beneath the sunglasses, the fake sideburns, behind the windows we cover with aluminum to block out the sun. Aloha from Hawaii. For the next while, I'll be your magpie, thieving bright things from a nest not his own. Your mockingbird, wrapping his tongue around another's songs. So let's not forget that Elvis Aaron never wrote a thing that I too could go gospel or country at any time. Meanwhile, I give you the Vegas years, the donuts and the cheeseburgers, the uppers, the downers, and in a Memphis theme park, how I ride the roller coaster after hours alone. As my guitar player says, I'm all gut and fucked up, and I never leave the house without a gun. Can I read another Elvis poem? Okay. So, has anybody ever seen the photographs of Elvis on the day that he visited Nixon? Have you ever seen those photos? They're pretty great, because you know, usually when a rock star goes to see a president, he doesn't dress as a rock star. But Elvis goes in, in his full, full on regalia. Um, you know, with the big rings and, and the, the, the outfits and everything. And you can actually read the letters, you can find the letters online that he wrote to Nixon before this, um, where he comes across as this very sort of crazed, paranoid character um, who's concerned about various things, including the Black Panthers and, and the hippies and, uh, you know, the state that the country's in. So, um, so this is, this is my sort of imagining of that, um, based on some of the letters written on American Airlines stationery. <laughs> Elvis and Nixon. The king's written to the White House from the air. I am Elvis, he declares, in his uncouth cursive. He's concerned about the hippies, the Black Panthers. Out loud, he wonders in his scattershot missive if he might do the country one good deed. Later, the knuckle duster rings, the velvet pants as they pose before Nixon's bird figurines. The king's vision of himself as an agent laid out on the table like the Colt 45 he's brought as gift. Both men at risk of tears as they swap stories of their early lives. Where else could the son of a farm laborer and the son of a lemon grower rise to be this president and this rock star? I'll read a couple more and then I'll leave you alone. Um, I want to read a poem in four parts. So I'm sorry, it's going to take a little while. Uh, it's Each part is addressed to a different character from a sort of a late 19th, early 20th century sideshow. Um, the first character is a, a guy called Tom Thumb, who was a dwarf who actually came from Connecticut and ended up really rich, um, made a lot of money, owned a yacht, lived in a big mansion in Bridgeport, 
Um, so this is addressed to him, and in it, I'm looking at the uh, the coming of the elephants every year when um, Barnum and Bailey's Circus comes to Manhattan. They walk the elephants through the Midtown Tunnel and then down uh, over to um, Madison Square Gardens. So this is what's being watched um, as Tom Thumb is being addressed. Sideshow. As they sweep through midnight and a spit of rain, they seem to step straight out of a vision or a pantomime in which two stone stagehands join into parody their awkward limbs beneath a fabric cut and sewn into a skin. I mean the grey-brown elephants linked trunk to tail and stepping one by one out of a tunnel on the East River that have me thinking again of you, Tom Thumb, transfigured and pushed out into the light as ladies and gentlemen, the man in miniature, presented so we might consider the dimensions of our race, or conversely, our need for diversion. A boy of five taught to take wine, to puff on cheap cigars, and later dressed up as Napoleon, his size explained by way of maternal impression, a mother's grief over a dog that drowns. And so what is it we're supposed to learn? The audience chuckling into our popcorn as your horse farts and you raise your bike horn hat, or standing damp and sullen behind police barricades as the troop lumbers trunks lolling across town towards the circus ring they'll circle into June. Something about want, which is the eye, its pupil black and wild, insatiable for whatever it hasn't had before. Something about the girl twirling a baton who goes before the elephants, leading them on. The second part is addressed to the Hilton sisters, uh, who were Siamese twins from Brighton in England, who ended up on Broadway for a while, and then in a weird twist of fate, working behind a cash register in North Carolina to the end of their lives. The Hilton sisters. Because you found a better end than drowning, or being given up to the state, your biographer warns me away from my need to pity the pair of you, put on display like that rough copy of Stone Age man and wife in their diorama in a midtown museum, staring through glass eyes at the crowd rushing between the dinosaurs and the planetarium. Not there nor later in your dank dressing room as you apply your eyeliners, your rouges, your powders, should I dare sympathize, not as on those battered saxophones you practice the screech and drone of your St. Louis blues. Outside, men stamp boot soles off the floor that will erupt soon into catcalls, applause, laughter, then near silence as you step from your final sleek garment and stand before us, Twin bodies, naked, exposed, fused at the sacrum to help us understand how you can be both plural and singular. The two and the one, and you know nothing yet about the word alone, and we'll go on knowing nothing until the great strip tease that waits beyond this one, where whatever moves the body sheds its cheap dress, and one sister bears the empty heft of the other from room to room, feeling something like frost enter, her own heart, her lungs, a space that wasn't there before, that suddenly opens. And the next is a character called Johnny Eck, who was born without legs. And so in his most famous routine, it was a box and blade routine where this magician would have his almost identical brother um, volunteer to be cut in half. And you can probably guess the rest, right? <laughs> How that would work out. Johnny Eck. 
What the punters are about to see is quite extraordinary. The body cut in half, but raised from death. The torso running on its hands after its own two legs. What they've missed already was your twin raising his arm that split second before the call went out for volunteers. While in the wings, a dwarf who'd rather play the part of Lear pulled past his waist a pair of tweed trousers, holes cut into the crotch so he can see. He will stand in for your brother's lower limbs while you stand in for his chest, his head, his arms. For the night's last act, this box and blade routine that will draw gasps, the odd B-movie scream, that will lodge itself like carnal knowledge in the memory of the boy in the front row, whose body will feel hard and then hollow as the seats round him snap back empty. But none of this has happened yet. You're in the box, which yes, of course, reminds us of a coffin. You're waiting for the saw's blunt teeth to cut through the cheap pine. And I like to think you're thinking of St. Jerome as Leonardo has him, half starved as he looks heavenwards and seems to ask, how do I live like this, my lord, severed from you and all I wish to know? A broken doll, the nurse called you, when you slipped shocked out of your mother's womb. A broken doll without the legs to kick at the cold air, like all the rest of us, cleaved, cleaving. The last one is about a character called Zip, uh, whose real name was Henry Johnson, um, who was displayed in Coney Island in a very problematic way. Um, the poem is also about my one and only trip to men's warehouse. <laughs> it's the most terrifying place on, on earth. And I was in there about five minutes and I, to, to browse, you know, you go into browse and within five minutes you're somehow dressed in a suit. There's one guy around your ankles with chalk and pins in his mouth. There's three other people standing around with other suits they're trying to get you to buy. And, you know, somebody running around with dress shoes. So I left without buying anything. Um, so that's, that's the other thing that's sort of that's going on in here. Zip, what is it? In a gray suit, I stepped this afternoon into an alcove with mirrors on all sides where the tailor smooths the shoulders, chalks the thighs of this outfit I will decide not to buy. While in a picture I'm making up of you, a pigtailed girl stands on tiptoe before the cage in which you've stood for years to whisper, what is it, into her father's ear. It is summer there, at the tail end of another century. A crowd gathers just out of shot to aim and fire and take home the goldfish in its squat bowl of water. And because they want, they want to disappear into the space where your Barnum's missing link and not a man sweating in a gorilla suit. All eyes on you, the tailor says, smiling, his mouth a pink pincushion as he kneels to mark the adjustments which, as it turns out, will never be made. <laughs> All eyes on you, the son of freed slaves who settled in the garden state to grow sweet potatoes and in a glasshouse plantains. And I wonder, in this light, sequestered here, if you were named for the concealed zipper that sealed your body into that costume of horsehair and bear fur, into the fissure between truth and tall story, a gap that grows wider as the girl squeezes one hand tighter round her father's palm, and with the other reaches between the bars to offer you the remains of her candy apple the tart and sweetness of its tooth-marked core. I'll read one more poem. Um, it's a poem about the very exciting topic of reading. Um, so, 
How many of you can remember, or maybe, maybe, people, maybe this isn't a thing anymore, but can you remember when you moved from reading things aloud to reading things internally? Max, can you remember? <laughs> Not exactly. Anybody else? Um, well, I, I think I certainly remember it very, very well. Um, and it's, it's the sort of the thing that, that part of this poem centers around. There are three different readers in the poem. The first one is St. Augustine, who has this moment in his confessions where he describes seeing Ambrose, his new kind of mentor slash boss, um, reading for the first time without moving his lips. And he's like, this is the craziest thing that he's ever seen in his life. He's never seen anybody do this before. Um, then there's my grandfather, who, you know, those of you who sort of object to your pre-1800 requirements, was a man who worked, um, he worked 10 hours a day as a bookkeeper and then came home at night and read Shakespeare or Ovid. That was, that was what he did for fun. Um, and then the third figure is from a Chardin painting called the Philosophe Lisson, which is a painting of a guy reading and it looks like he's about to sort of disappear into his book. Uh, he's so into it. So the silent reader. To Augustine, newly arrived in Rome, it must seem almost a miracle. Hunched over the letters of St. Paul, the man with the rough bowl cut in the washed out blue robe is busy luring himself into himself. Consider how a bucket will hover over the dry mouth of a well before the calloused palms of some aged villager take up the rope and lure the vessel towards the dark. There's weight and measure to the gesture, just as there's weight and measure to the way the bishop scans the saint's letters, the words like water raised into daylight where the world of objects begins to disappear. Courtyard, olive tree, suddenly barely there, even the bench on which he sits obscured, so that if you tapped Ambrose on the shoulder to ask his place of birth, his mother's maiden name, he'd have to pause a moment to remember what he was and is, heart and lungs, belly and genitals, a man reading without moving his lips his pupils flitting over the characters, the way a bee will lift its striped body from flower to flower. The art for him, completely ordinary, though to Augustine it must be spectacle beyond any chained bear he set upon by howling dogs or the gleaming spurs of any prize rooster he might once have lost a coin over. And perhaps it's this he half means later, when he writes of the exquisite delight savored in a secret mouth, of the wind that can blow through our house of straw. Does that same wind blow through my grandfather's house, I wonder, as he reads, night hangs upon mine eyes, my bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour, leaping slightly in his favorite chair as the cuckoo clock above his head erupts, the bird shot out onto the room in its tense spring, Brutus about to run onto his own blade, and the blackness in my grandfather's lungs beginning to settle into something final as the darkness near the bottom of a well. Soon he will become his books, the reek of ash trapped in a rack of pipes, a shape I can only half discern, yawning, rolling his eyes before he settles back into the line. I do not know whence I came into this life that is but a dying, Augustine confides, or rather this dying state that leads to life. And I picture him a year on from this scene, as the doctors in their blue robes hack through one of his feet to stop the spread of gangrene. I think of how last year, at an exhibition of bodies, the smiling intern placed onto my palm a shellacked human brain, its sections the peeled flesh of an orange, its heft about the same as that small volume he cradles between his palms. How strange the way we become the objects that contain us, the way we are contained in what persists, 
a tea-stained copy of Julius Caesar, the gold-trimmed pages of the letters of St. Paul, or the arrangement of light and colour in Chardin's Le Philosophe Lisson, where the painter's friend, of whom we know almost nothing, bends forever into his chapter, the sleeve of his lush coat brushing the hourglass where the sand has settled in the lower bulb, the quill at his elbow, pensive in the pot of ink, with which he'll make his own small plea against extinction, meeting the dead still living on the living page. Thank you so much. Thank you.